Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Sitting in for Aaron Powell is Jason Kuznicki, a research fellow at the Cato Institute and the editor of Cato Unbound. Joining us today are Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch. Nick Gillespie is the editor-in-chief of Reason.com and Reason TV. Matt Welch is the editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, which has been a mainstay of libertarianism since 1968, and the co-host of a new Fox Business Network show called The Independence, which airs on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Together, Matt and Nick are also the authors of a 2011 book, The Declaration of Independence, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong with America. Welcome to Free Thoughts, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. So the first question is, what is an independent in the sense of both your show, Matt, and the book and how is that related to libertarianism? Um, I would describe the independent uh, strictly as people who have disaffiliated from the Republican and Democratic tribes. Um, Gallup has been asking and Pew has been asking – Gallup for 20 years, 25, Pew for 40, um, not necessarily who are you registered with but who do you sort of feel like part of? Who do you affiliate with? Democrats, Republicans or nobody. Uh, and the nobody in 1970 was 20 percent. Now the nobody is up around 43 percent, 46 percent by some measures. Uh, last year, 2013, 14, 13, I'm, uh, we're, we're in the future, uh, was the highest in the history that Gallup has been um, – uh, studying it, which was at 43 percent. But at the end of the year, it was at 46. Those trend lines, we argue in our book, are unmistakable and it maps onto what we are experiencing in the rest of our lives. We are no longer loyal to brands. We are free agent shoppers, mix and match kind of personal identities. Um, so when you're independent and you can look at poll data on a, a variety of questions, you don't, you're not predictable. Right? Uh, so your view on the NSA does not depend on whether George W. Bush or Barack Obama is in power, quite unlike the view on the NSA of Most Democrats player. and Republicans. Team players, um, yeah. And so people are not just becoming more independent themselves and, and sort of not listening, not hearing the dog whistles, but they're also – and maybe Nick can speak to this more – using the concept, the tactic of independence as a way to exert their will onto a tired and sclerotic political system. Yeah, and I think it's important. Uh, we certainly do this in the book. And actually, this, I think, is the most exciting part of the Fox Business show that Matt's co-hosting with Kennedy and Camille Foster, is that it's it's broader than politics. It informs politics. But it's this sense of independence, of detribalization, where you're not mm -hmm. saying, OK, you know what? I come from a family that always buys Ford cars or Chevrolets. It isn't like that. Each time you're buying a car or even making a decision to buy a car, you're rethinking that from a different position. And it's a plurality of people. It's not quite a, a majority yet. And when you start thinking about that in terms of racial identity or cultural identity, uh, you know, there's a reason why you know, independent cinema, independent music, all of this stuff is kind of flourishing in concert with one another. And it's very exciting. It's, it's a, an outgrowth of technology. It's an outgrowth of wealth, outgrowth of increases in education that may not bring smarts with it, but bring a sense of like, you know what, I, I, I'm, I can make my own decisions and God damn it, I'm going to make my own decisions. So it, it does lead to an unpredictability, I think, if you're trying to say, OK, well, you know, we know we've got this amount of Democratic voters. They'll do whatever we want if we say we're Democrats or Republicans. And what, uh, you know, what a lot of businesses have had to do, a lot of churches uh, and certainly politics. And one of the th notes that we keep hitting in the book is that politics is a lagging indicator for mm -hmm. where society is. It's the uh, Mr. T of the A-team. It's, you know, it's the last <laughs> one to get the joke. Um, you know, they have not quite figured out how to deal with uh, you know, right now we have people like Rand Paul, who is fabulous on on the NSA and fighting against the Defense Department, and is also talking about welfare. I mean, this is a, a kind of Republicans don't know how to deal with mm. him, much less Democrats, and we're building a new kind of consensus, which is built around independence. And the overlap with with libertarianism is this: libertarians themselves are much more independent than they used to be. They used to be much more reliable Republican vote mm -hmm. uh, during the Cold War, for example. Uh, and especially young libertarians, they are completely unpredictable. They mm -hmm. vote for Barack Obama. They're crazy. Yeah, they cray. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, also, and independents themselves, when you when you uh, uh, 
poll their attitudes, they tend to be more libertarian than an already trending libertarian public is on issues okay. like gay marriage, on issues like the size and scope of government, uh, on issues like uh, legalizing marijuana. So uh, they are kind of the cutting edge of where the culture and politics will end up going. And it's precisely in those areas where they and the public at large are trending in a direction and yet are not being served by the two political tribes. That's where dynamic change is happening right now. I mean a year and a half ago, if we thought we'd be sitting around talking about having two uh, you know, legal states for, uh, for recreational marijuana and a president changing his tune on it every single day, kind of that you, you can feel the, cl- the fists unclenching all around the country and politicians are now scrambling to out you – know, uh, uh, anti-drug war one another. That was crazy talk a year and a half ago only. But if you'd been studying the trend lines and the poll lines of independents in particular and also of the general public compared to what their useless political parties were doing, this would have been predictable. And in fact, we predicted that in the book. So do you think that – there's another argument though that you could say that the tribalism is increasing, which I think it's a good point that you yeah. know it's increasing across the board. Uh, we don't watch the same TV shows anymore. You know, well, 80 million people watch MASH yeah. in a, and only that's a, I mean, I, I think uh, – I, I mean I think you're right in, in one way and, and off base in another. Uh, there's no question that there's larger uh, – there's more fragmentation in mm-hmm. terms of certain types of cultural uh, consumption and even political consumption. I, you know, t- the TV shows, I remember writing about uh, TV audiences back when Seinfeld was the number one show. Mm-hmm. Its ratings would not have placed it in the top ten in the years when the Beverly Hillbillies was the top yeah, show. Yeah, everyone watched yeah, it. You know, it was a water and, cooler conversation. So, yeah, and, and yet – Seinfeld was a show that still infuses our popular culture and reference today. So we can overplay fragmentation and a lot of critics, especially on the left and sometimes on the right, say, you know, this is the problem with capitalism is that it fragments, it segments people into very small niches and destroys common culture and things like that. I I think there's some truth to that. We can now consume and produce the culture we want and that leads to a more varied culture. It leads to a more varied produce section in the supermarket. And when you go to restaurants and that's all good and I don't think there's that much of a loss. But you are right, I think, in saying that the tribalism in politics among the dead enders Mm -hmm. and, you know, and now we're down to, according to Gallup, I guess it's like, you know, down from almost 50 percent of people in the early 70s considering themselves Democrats, not necessarily registering but considering that. It's down to like 31 or 32. For Republicans, it's down to like 25 percent of the population. Those people – these are the uh, you know the, the that Japanese soldier who famously stayed kept fighting the war. Yeah, yeah. you know he just died. Nah. Yeah, for wait, years later. But that's... wait, but wait. I'm saying that these these people who are still like into political identities that they think is are fixed and unchanging. They are dead enders, and they are getting more and more ballistic, which is why you have, uh, you know, it's MSNBC versus uh, Fox, Fox News. News. It is Republicans versus Democrats, like trying to pretend they have nothing in common when in fact they're pretty similar. Well, oh, they are pretty similar but they also have a really big structural advantage that's not going to go away. Oh, I mean, that's if, you're, true. if you're looking at party politics, the entire reason it exists is because of the nature of our election law, the nature right. of you know, first past the post voting yep. and voter access, you know, qualifications for, for getting on the ballot and uh, – you know, that's not going away. That's not going to change. And Nor is so what there... you're seeing is you're seeing is yes, people are disaffected with the system, but they have nowhere else to go. And so while identification with a particular party may be in decline, uh, the the perception of the other party is getting worse and worse and worse Absolutely. all the time. We talk about this a lot in our book. When we uh, toured it, uh, people would always ask, you know, oh, so does this mean the Libertarian Party is going to break through or we're going to finally break apart the two-party system? And we would be perpetually disappointing to all those people because no, it's not going to happen. Uh, what's going Because – uh, unlike all businesses, which you know, and all monopolies and duopolies out there, which fail, they fail. I mean, remember when Microsoft was a monopoly? How'd that work yeah. out for everybody? AMP Grocery. Uh, you know, <laughs> a, a, they, these things fail. Kodak uh, is yeah. fail. Um, unlike that, government has a guaranteed revenue stream. You know, that revenue stream might contract in some years and, and expand, but they have a guaranteed revenue stream. So that means it's really going to happen to that last. So what you look for is where are the opportunities where people are going uh, can affect and change the system. And they change the system with the drug war because they have the ability to sign petitions and do state ballot initiatives that root around. I mean this is all a federalism experiment 
uh, with uh, ballot access initiatives that that has made this thing po- possible in education when they were able to root around the existing system by by opting out of it, by creating some school choice here and there, uh, by homeschooling. Uh, we're seeing higher education with MOOCs and various things like that. So um, look for those those pressure valve points where people can get around polit- politics. Suddenly that changes the political conversation pretty quickly on some of these issues. So you're right. It's not going to be a third party nirvana anytime soon. Um, but that But it's also – uh, more inherently unstable and dynamic now, which I think is exciting. Yeah, you know, we talked in, uh, I guess, in the Declaration of Independence as well as, you know, there are other cases of this, but when you looked at the way that uh, transpartisan groups of, of Republicans and Democrats in Congress rose up, uh, you know, and they were pushed by people outside of the politi- normal political process to, to block things like uh, PIPA and SOPA, mm-hmm. the Stop mm-hmm. Online uh, Piracy Act and whatnot. They, you know, you, we're starting to see this is true of pot legalization of gay marriage, where you see these kind of transit, transitory ad hoc coalitions that come together, pulling from the right and the left, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, to tackle a certain issue, and then it doesn't hold up because these people don't like each other very much. But, mm-hmm. it, but it'll, so it'll two happen. parties, yes, but you know that that doesn't mean that the independent voice is necessarily being shut out. Yeah, you will see. For instance, I think this year a success probably led by Justin Amash, maybe in concert with people like Ron Wyden, other Ron Wyden's in the Senate of of limiting, trimming the sales of the NSA. It's not going to come from Obama. It's going to come from this bipartisan, literally bipartisan and also you know, anti-establishmentarian coalition because the heads of both parties are like, no, NSA is cool. We got no problems. Totally legal, totally constitutional. Leave us alone type of thing. They came within just a few votes of defunding the NSA last summer. I predict that this year something will happen and it will happen partially because of a rise of independence and a feel like – and the notion, as Nick said, that you can have a single issue coalition on, on something. But as Jason said, so I mean it, we think that sort of – the D's and the R's at least in name are here to stay and – but possibly at least some of the discussion has been if libertarians can evacuate the Republican Party and fill it back up and have R mean something different and then of course a lot of Republicans are resisting that, calling libertarians you know, not only just wacky but also dist- the fact that they're destroying the coalition and getting Democrats elected this, by doing yeah, that. This what's is, the, what's well, the response to that? OK. There's, there, I think there's two responses I'm sure Matt can add to this. First is that like when you look at the governor race in Virginia, which was hotly contested and and should have been the Republicans to win because mm-hmm. Terry McAuliffe is a horrible candidate. That and even the left even, thinks that. Yeah, yeah. Even, even his family hates yeah. him. I'm sure they didn't <laughs> vote for him. But then the Republicans ran a very hardcore social conservative for whatever other virtues he might have, Ken Cuccinelli. Um, and then you had a libertarian candidate get what, like 6.5 percent of the vote, uh, which he took from McAuliffe. I mean the idea that libertarians – are taking votes from Republicans or are electing Democrats has two fallacies in it. One is that oftentimes, as in the case of Cuccinelli, there are actually all of the exit poll data show that he pulled votes from McAuliffe, not from the Republican. Uh, but then it also even more fundamentally presumes that libertarian votes somehow belong to the Republicans. Mm-hmm. And one of the great things about independence and I think uh, in political independence and libertarians are starting to understand and we, we flipped this a couple of times a few elections ago in, in reason. Instead of saying how can we get the Republicans to you know, not be so awful on the issues we care about. It was more like, you know what we have to do is we have to stake our independence as a group and say, you know what, here's what we stand for. If you want our votes, it's like the easiest thing in the world to win our votes Mm -hmm. because we want the same thing in every election. Republicans, tell us what you're going to do for us instead of how can we serve you and then be disappointed by you. And Democrats, if you want to, if you want to stop bombing countries indiscriminately, obviously they don't. If you want to cut defense spending, they don't. If you want to curtail the NSA, if you want to actually be liberal like you claim to be on lifestyle issues, you know, you got our votes. Mm-hmm. If if you'll also do this, that, and the other thing, or meet us part way. And so, you know, I I think that's a place where independence is starting to grow. And libertarians need to understand that. We don't belong to either party and more importantly, those parties have to understand that if they want our votes, very easy to get because you know libertarian voters are reliable, predictable and dogmatic about 
reducing the size, scope, and spending of government. That's all you have to do. There's to, more... to be independent is actually is actually really important because you can yeah. you can see the opposite of that in say the pro life movement, where mm-hmm. there's no question what party they're going to vote for, and a cynic will look at that and say, well, of course, then that means the party doesn't really have to do anything for them. Right. And you get a lot of symbolic votes on pro life issues, but you don't really see the Republican Party trying very, very hard to actually ban abortion. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of work uh, in tiny little steps along the margins to make things maybe a little harder here or there. But it's never going to happen because then they know that they will lose these votes. Ninety. If there's any population group of which 90 percent votes for one of those two parties, you can bet that that group is not going to get what they want in the election. It's this weird perversity and I think more and more people are waking up to that. I mean think of how many Democrats uh, have been thinking that they've been voting for the party that's against the drug war for 20 or 30 or 40 years. After Obama immediately you know, broke all George W. Bush's records of raiding medical marijuana shops, you, see, you started to see the fog slowly lifting. And, and, and deporting immigrants. And deporting you know, uh, I immigrants. I mean it's like it goes on. Yeah. Drone, uh, drone attacks. Drone yeah. attacks. Uh, and what I'm heartened by is that finally and belatedly we were seeing some Democrats starting to primary one another over these issues. There's Beto O'Rourke mm-hmm. who primaried successfully a Democrat down in uh, New Mexico on or the issue – El Paso. On El Paso uh, on the issue of the drug war and there's a recent uh, political story saying that there's a spate of new candidates who are both primarying and also running against uh, Republicans in the general based on surveillance and opposition to that. So once – they have been studying the, the Tea Party's uh, tactics, you know, uh, all these two-party politics, they're always copying each other's moves, you know, media matters and the Soros empire was sort of a response to the Republican revolution of 94 in some ways. And so they're going to take those tactics hopefully and start doing that – the same kind of thing that Club for Growth and Freedom Works and others have been doing on the right, which is, hey, we want to impose our values and make these people wake up to issues that we really want. And that will all be to the good of libertarians and independents. If we have more Jared Polis Democrats, then Democrats are a lot more interesting than they currently are now to libertarians. But where do we see – so I've always said that I think the Democrat barometer is like Aaron Sorkin. Wherever Aaron Sorkin is, like in the West Wing, it's about technocracy and a really smart president, Clinton era stuff. Now they get disappointed in Obama and now he's at the newsroom, which is we need better media to get out there and shine a light on something. But we also have another thing coming in, which I think is a, a danger, is the populism. Uh, right from the Democrats coming in with Elizabeth Warren populism, and they might start primarying people on that issue, at the at, at a Tea Party type of thing. Who's going to give away the most spoils to the to the constituencies? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, yeah. I mean, that, there's no question of that. And you also see some right wing populism, and you know, I mean, obviously, people have talked about libertarian populism as well. Um, and that's always a concern. What is interesting is that when you look at broad survey data, and of course, you know, people may say one thing in a survey, and then when they're put in a ballot box, they're going to, you know, the choices are are very different, and what they're going to do behind the curtain, uh, you know, might be very different. But large numbers of people say the government is too powerful and that the government spends too much money. And it strikes me that Elizabeth Warren is not the new, you know, she's not the new birth of populism. She's like the last dying light. Okay. Um, uh, because people understand that you know, just jacking up the government government control of large day to day transactions never works very well. I mean, we live in a post DMV world <laughs> where you know we still make jokes about the DMV, but most states have privatized it or changed it into much more of a customer model. Uh, people aren't going to be going back to like, oh, you know, it'll be great. Let's go down to the block captain and uh, see if we can get a permit to uh, put a hot dog stand up. People, people are done with that because independence and this is, you know, if we, I mean, obviously we're talking about the future of libertarianism or the past. We need to get out of a, pol- a specifically political phase too because this move towards independence, which uh, kind of coheres well with libertarianism, but it's not identical to it, but it's broadly based. It's culturally based. It's personal based. Uh, you know, it's brands. It's like, you know, we are independent now. And so people have to make, you know, people who want us to follow them or buy their ideas and buy their products has to pitch to us each time and make a convincing case. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would add that there's, I mean, we are experiencing a big sort in the country uh, pursuant to what you were talking about earlier and in, in like the increased moving, tribe. Yeah. People are moving. Yeah. You know, I've, I've moved to increasingly, you know, uh, dark 
dark, deep blue uh, cities. I've gone from L.A. Because you to, want your Trader Joe's. To right? Washington, D.C., to Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think the last time that I lived in a place that didn't vote for a Democrat, at least 70 percent, uh, was uh, maybe 20 years ago or something like that. Or when you were briefly in Cuba. There was more <laughs> yeah. opposition Prong. to the Democratic yeah. Party. Right? Uh, I mean, yeah. more than, so than in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. But uh, so uh, part of the De- Bill de Blasio, Elizabeth Warren, I, th- I think is, is a, a sign of that, of people are shorting more ideologically and geographically. Um, but also it's a response to the economy has sucked for six years and it wasn't all that great for the eight years before that. Mm. Um, you know, George W. Bush did not create a single or, you know, the the country did not create a single net private job uh, during his presidency, which is just an atrocious record. And then obviously it's been a lot worse under Obama. And so there's got – there's going to be reactions to this. Uh, it's the wrong reaction on the left and we've seen uh, to my great chagrin, the, the Democratic Party, kind of the center of it, uh, move very, very leftward on economics uh, since the time of Bill Clinton. I mean, third way Democrats, new Democrats, all that thing is dead. It's amazing to watch them and I saw this at the 2008 Democratic Convention where – Hillary Clinton sat and took credit for every single good thing that happened under Bill Clinton and then spent the rest of the time trashing all of the policies that made that possible, right? Like just trashing free trade, mm-hmm. trashing NAFTA, trashing uh, Glass-Steagall Act, not that that made anything necessarily possible. And of course, but just, not taking responsibility for DOMA or the Welfare Reform Act. Well, welfare Reform, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of stunning to watch. And so uh, it, Democrats, uh, to, I think the, to go on what Nick was talking about, I mean, if they think this is national saleable politics – to have $15 minimum wages everywhere and to say that we really need to you know, expand Social Security and Medicare right now as the kind of Krugmanite left is going, mm-hmm. good luck with that because mm-hmm. there's never been any poll support for that. And after the disaster of Obamacare, there's no appetite for grand schemes. The next grand – I can't even think of the next grand government scheme that we will see after the debacle of Obamacare. Yeah, it's it's actually it's really interesting to watch the poll numbers for uh, how many people think that the government should be uh, running our healthcare system. And shortly after the implementation of the first bits of Obamacare and continuing ever since then, there's just been this dramatic slide in in how many people think this is an appropriate thing for the government to be doing. So, uh, you know, Nate Silver, uh, when he was at the New York Times and the blogger who started at five thirty eight as an independent blog, went to New York Times, is now at ESPN. Last year, I guess he had a pretty interesting thing, which he was actually obviously reading a lot of reason and Cato stuff. Mm-hmm. Of where you know, the, one of his points was that the government has gone from providing um, various kinds of uh, services or regulations to basically being an insurance provider. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it provides more and more in terms of health care, in terms of retirement, and things like that. And he pointed out, you know, nobody likes their insurance agent. And you know, if the government is, you know, is now an insurance agent where more and more of its money or our money is spent in transfer programs and saying, okay, here's guaranteed income, guaranteed retirement, guaranteed health care, it's going to sink in popularity and I think we're seeing that. Yeah. Ezra Klein has an analysis where he he points out that if you look at the budget of the federal government, essentially it is a very well-armed insurance provider right. is what he mm. calls it. And I want to say to him, Ezra, my friend, why are you yeah. not over here with us as a libertarian? Yeah. Isn't that obvious? Because – I mean and this is where I, – and I don't think this tracks very, even into the Democratic Party but certainly not into the uh, country at large. You know, there's a, a bunch of people. Klein is like this. Krugman certainly. You know, well, you know, but we'll do it smarter. I mean, they really do have that kind of Hayekian fatal conceit, mm-hmm. and it might not be as grand as you know the Bauhaus crowd or something that we can contr- we can lay out a perfect city and order society perfectly. But they really do think like, oh, we just have to twist a couple dials here and you know adjust for this and give a little bit of a more of a wide ranging tax break here and it'll work out and. It just that's just not the way the world is going, and the way it, the reason it isn't is because people have had a taste of what happens when they have a little bit of freedom to just kind of do what they think they want to do. You I, seem incredibly optimistic, <laughs> uh, and if I if I may just throw a little bit of cold water here, I I I recall. Well, first of all, I'll say this optimism is a really big change in the libertarian movement because if you go back and look at libertarian literature from say the 1970s, 
you will read things like by 1985, the stock market will have collapsed, right. the dollar will be worthless, the Soviet Union will be in charge and, and you know, just really, Catastrophe really horribly, yeah. horribly dire predictions about what's coming in the future. And, uh, and I, even I, I've got one, uh, one thing I'm, I'm thinking about that Murray Rothbard wrote for – it was a book about predicting the future and he, he had a little blurb in it and he said, yeah, we're going to collapse. We are absolutely going to collapse and this was in the late 70s. Uh, you seem to be very optimistic. Uh, what's changed? Nothing's changed in terms of reason. I mean, uh, Nick and I have been fortunate enough to uh, uh, have edited the magazine. And if you go back and look at the archives, and Rothbard used to be a columnist, and he was probably the most apocalyptic writer in the history of of uh, reason. He sort of stuck out in there because um, you know we have the DNA of actually being optimistic. There was a cover story, I think, from the late seventies talking about how. All these computers are going to network with one another and you're going to be able to work out of your own home and plug into a decentralized network. It's going to empower the individual. I mean it wow. really kind of predicted the internet in a way without using the word. Um, uh, there and- is – I mean to be, to be fair, there is some apocalypticism in reason. I remember a 70s interview with Harry Bram where he was talking about, look, of course you got to buy gold but then you also have to stash it far enough out of the city <laughs> – <laughs> uh, so that the hordes don't come to it when the whole you know shitstorm happens, but it's got to be close enough where you can get to it you know quickly without other people finding. But yeah, continue. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so I mean, and, and I think there is always been a, there's a contemporary stream of yeah. apocalyptic libertarianism. Oh, I mean, for sure. l- yeah. listen to Peter Schiff for a half a day or half a minute, right, yeah. and you know we, it's going to be a Weimar Germany. Things are going to collapse. We had a we had a. a By the way, we all are. Uh, we're uh, Matt and I. We should explain that we also are buying heavily in wheelbarrow stocks. Oh, yes. uh, okay. Because you know it's the one thing yeah. that'll hold up under uh, hyperinflation. <laughs> but I think there's a tension there. I mean, uh, I think sort of uh, Austrian economic libertarianism tends to go more towards the apocalypticism uh, kind of vein. And also, let's remember, like back in the seventies, the seventies kind of sucked, even though there were when Nick and I grew up and we uh, loved uh, them. Yeah, now this is the this is the fun. Well, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, sorry, I mean, uh, uh, as Except a like for the first four as a mac- yeah. as a macro story, as a macroeconomic story, and as like you know safety and city stories, Mm -hmm. the 70s suck. But as Nick and I wrote in the intro to the book, um, it was actually this incredible ferment for incredibly positive change. I mean, if uh, and we started uh, writing our kind of libertarian moment, which is an essay that ended up becoming the book. Um, It was targeted for (laughs) our 40th anniversary, right, issue, which we decided for some reason was going to be the November 2008 issue. So let's remember what was happening in the fall of 2008. Nick and I were like, we're coming out guns blazing. It's really on us. We're ready to go. Financial crisis. George W. Bush says, you know, normally I'm a fan of capitalism, but uh, the entire country goes crazy. Uh, And so we had to finish (laughs) the essay under these circumstances. And it was a big gut check. Like, do we even really believe this? All this kind of stuff. And we hearken back to history of 1971, August 9th, when Nixon, you know, goes off the gold standard, wage and price controls, like crazy stuff that we can't currently imagine. And if we, if someone would have said at that moment, in August of 1971, yeah, the 70s are actually going to be a decade of great libertarian change. You would have been hauled off into you know, the one floor over the cuckoo's nest set yeah. and like uh, administered spanks by Nurse Ratchet. <laughs> but yet it was there. There was you – know, airline deregulation was already starting to kind of wheeze into gear. Uh, the military draft had ended within a couple of years after Legalizing that. home brewing. Legalizing yeah. home brewing. All yeah. these kind yeah. of things. I mean there were actually positive economic changes or deregulatory mm-hmm. changes. But then there was also you – know, and it's not to say that you know, there was uh, violence and cities continue to uh, climb. Crime rates went up and things like that. But by the same token, there was a massive uh, uh, you know, and productive change in personal lifestyle. Things loosened up so much and there's so much you – know, I mean the, the, the PC revolution is a function of the 70s. It didn't happen in the 60s and it didn't happen in the 80s. It happened in the 70s and there was all kinds of really interesting ferment going on. Incredible culture. I mean it's, yeah. it's a, it was a remarkable – I mean uh, Tom – Wolf in the me decade mm-hmm. uh, was talking about how it, it was really finally the sort of uh, uh, manifestation of a real middle class where everyone could be their own kind of king and, and – And act like it and have that sense of entitlement like an aristocrat like, hey, you know what? I'm going to dress like the king. You know, Men and women started dressing flashily. Mm-hmm. Uh, cheap goods became available for the first time in the 70s like consumer goods. 
And yeah, we're going to, you know, you can't tell by looking at somebody's collar anymore what they were like. That happened in the 70s. So you, if you overfocus on, you know, what's happening in Washington and and a lot of the macro stuff, and also if you come from certain traditions within libertarianism, you can get to the apocalypse really quick. But then if you step back and look at long trend lines since 1800 or even since 1970, which we repeatedly do in the book, mm-hmm. it's really hard to take to be taken seriously when you say, yeah, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Even though now two-thirds of the world is free, now that a billion people have gone out of poverty in the last 15, 20 years, I mean the long-trend uh, indicators are still phenomenal and we should be optimistic about it. And I think that's one of the interesting points in the book. You talk about sort of mass amnesia and call out the fact that people seem to be forgetting all the time. Uh, politically, for example, the permanent Republican majority right. idea in the early 2000s. And which and was then, immediately replaced by the permanent Democratic majority yes. uh, You know, because what? In 2006, it was all over whenever the Democrats took over and then Obama wins and then you know in 2010, we're back and now everybody's predicting the Republicans are going to retake the Senate. So yeah. Trevor And another idea of, of that amnesia is the deregulation which you just mm-hmm. mentioned in the, in the you know, horrible Carter days and how that actually happened with Democrats doing that. Right. Could, could we ever imagine – would it just be a part of me participating in this amnesia to think that Democrats would ever – Ted Kennedy – just then, then non-Justice Breyer, now Justice Breyer, Ralph Nader, uh, Ralph Nader, like being a part of this, could this happen again from the left? Could the, could they get into the deregulation? It doesn't look likely in the short term, for sure. Um, but uh, but who knows? I mean, things yeah, well, are so flip unpredictable. It, like, who would have thought that it'd be a Republican? You know, like a rabid Republican leading or two leading attacks on the NSA and the surveillance state and and the defense state. Uh, the military industrial complex when you look at people like Justin Amash and Rand Paul these guys are out there you know leading the battle and uh you know so maybe the same part of the past the patriot act yeah, yeah. you know so and, I mean, and actually in, even the guy who passed the patriot or wrote the patriot yeah. act is now campaigning against the there, there are a lot of people in both parties who really have no particular brief for or against the surveillance state they just don't and yeah. so you'll see people like Sean Hannity saying that the NSA is vital and it's doing important work and it needs to be it needs to be doing this work in secret but that was when George W Bush was right. president and now he's condemning it when Obama was a senator he was against a lot of the things that he's in favor of now and it's all very well documented and they just they just change uh there are only a very few that are consistent about anything like that uh, either for or against. So I, I do would suggest worry uh, about the – I mean the, the thing that worries me the most uh, about the, the contemporary Democratic Party by which I mean uh, since Clinton, uh, since Bill Clinton is he does seem to have been the last of the free trade Democrats mm-hmm. in, a, in a really profound way and it's important to recognize. I mean NAFTA, you know, and there, obviously there's issues with it but NAFTA was a, a good step forward in all sorts of ways and it was – ultimately it was Clinton and Al Gore who sold that to the American public and to their own party. It doesn't seem like – I mean as Matt was saying, like Hillary Clinton is not the free trader that her husband was and it's, it's kind of hard to find people in the Democratic Party who are like that. Yeah, and I mean, what you do with the hypocrisy is you say, "Welcome, you know, welcome to our side. <laughs> yeah. Let's make it last a little bit longer. Uh, next time, we won't believe you." I mean, and then hope that you actually can get some people there who start from those principles, whether they're coming from Republican or Democratic side. And there are a few of those people now who are being elected on those principles, and they're driving it. And what you find also is that. Uh, especially on these issues where there's such a gap between the American public and uh, and what effective bipartisan government ends up being, a lot of this stuff is just inertia. Mm-hmm. I mean, who at the end was really in favor of the drug war? We're starting to to learn that right now. It's about five people. Mm-hmm. It's like David Brooks, yeah. Patrick Kennedy, David Frum. Yeah. Uh, am I leaving many people out? Like some columnist you never heard of at the Washington Examiner, El- Emily Miller. Sorry, <laughs> Emily. Um, you know, uh, and a few other people. And their arguments are terrible because mm-hmm. they could use for years. The point and the giggle like, uh, oh, you silly people. What are you smoking? Ha, ha, ha. Mm-hmm. And you could use this sort of marginalization. You know, Republicans, when they were in power, did this on national security all the time. The 2004 Republican convention in New York was just a festival of calling Democrats and everybody's girly men and pussies. I mean it was 
awful. It was it was mm-hmm. disgusting yeah. display. But what it revealed is that they didn't have good arguments. And so now, uh, you know, when we talk about the NSA, who's the other side? It's Peter King. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's yeah. ignoramuses yeah, <laughs> talking Diane out of their ass, have no you know. idea what they're talking about, saying, of course, this is totally a thousand percent constitutional. There hasn't been a single documented abuse. They're just exposed as liars every day. The hearing last week, we heard about we heard about Eric Snowden. Uh, we yeah, heard yeah. about Edwin Snowden, I think. Right. I, maybe yeah. those are his like brothers yeah. or something. But yeah. yeah, I mean, these people are not well informed. Well, yeah. and I, again, not to sell it too much in that, like, okay, everything's coming up uh, libertarian, and after this, we can go and look at our bank accounts, which have been drained of you know of meaning by uh, you know macroeconomic policy, mm-hmm. uh, but. It is. I think Matt was talking about kind of like the establishment versus upstarts and that that's really becoming more and more into focus. Uh, and I was thinking about because when you're talking about like who's defending the NSA and, you know, the, the establishment sent out uh, Dianne Feinstein and Mike Rogers, you know, Republic, a Democrat and a Republican who were saying exactly the same thing, who could only point to two cases supposedly where the NSA surveillance actually led to the stopping of terrorist acts. It was a Zazi and Headley case, two mm-hmm. cases from a couple of years ago, which were not done. They were done through old-fashioned police mm-hmm. work and surveillance work. One of those guys, Headley, was actually a Drug Enforcement Administration informant who they had been tracking. So it's like you're telling me you need the NSA to be taking in everybody's every move everywhere in order to keep tabs on a on a DEA informant. And it's like it's it's a joke and it's really – it's the establishment versus other people who are waking up and saying, you know what? I'm really not getting anything out of this relationship and you better start coming towards me. Mm. And that's the independence. And I think libertarians, because they've been so disenfranchised for so long of never really fitting into either existing party or even a broadly based right-wing, left-wing ideology, we're at the lead of that. If you're going to be a libertarian cynic, I mean, you're hardly ever disappointed by the establishment. You know, <laughs> even even the most cynical libertarians, yeah. I think, were a little bit surprised by all of the NSA revelations. Yeah. And uh, then I would I, I would want to ask this question in part because we've got it on our sheet here. But is it possible to be too cynical? Because I do mm-hmm. hear that from people. I, I when I say things that I know are you know from that libertarian cynic in me. Uh, people say, you know, you're just too cynical. You ought to, you ought to trust a little bit more. And you know, these are not evil people in our government. They're actually trying to help. They're well intentioned. Yeah. And uh, is there is there anything to that? I don't think it's a question of people being evil. I was going to say, you know, I I think uh, we're talking a few days after the State of the Union address. I think the gesture towards Corey Remsburg, the uh, mm. army sergeant, the ranger who was, you know, just catastrophically destroyed Ten in tours, Afghanistan yeah. war, mm. uh, you know, by Obama. That I, – I don't know how anybody can look at that and not have a deep revulsion towards politics and become cynical because, it, you know, after a totally lousy speech which where he was just kind of, you know, repeating the same thing he says all the time and stupid ideas like the my IRA, you know, mm. f- savings plan and then he's like, oh, yeah, and then look at this mangled corpse, you know, walking corpse of a guy who I sent to Afghanistan. Let's cheer his sacrifice. Good night, everybody. Uh, you know, I think people understand that this this is a guy who did what he was asked to do, who sacrificed his life. And we have to ask him, I mean, to use a biblical metaphor, I mean, you know, he's like Isaac on the altar. We sacrificed him and to what end? And Obama has, you know, he has jacked up the cynicism quotient like through the roof on that. Having said that, I don't think people in politics are evil. I don't think most poli- you know, legislators are evil and I don't think that's what cynicism is about. It's more people are ready to get on with their own lives and they just don't want to be rule bound by a bunch of people who don't know who they are or what they're about or how they want to live in the future. But- yeah, I think it's a, it's a shortcut that uh, a lot of uh, uh, people take uh, whenever they're in opposition just to assume the worst motivations on the other side and it's a shortcut to the truth. You're actually not getting there faster. Uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't actually it, – it's best to understand the best of the uh, other side's motivations um, because that actually tells uh, a more true story and a more libertarian story which is that, you know, as uh, Charles Peters who founded the Washington Monthly back when there was that kind of skepticism uh, among uh, liberals, uh, he would point out it's not enough just to have beautiful divine motivations you actually there's reasons why systems do or do not work and part of it is that systems largely bureaucratic ones tend to not work so let's figure that out um, it's been a real uh, back intellectual backslide of the democrats i think and 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 progressives writ large is that they've retreated 
uh, to motivations uh, on the other side. So, you know, you have to be one of us because the other side really is about rich white people who want to suppress everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, even though Republicans always live down to that uh, <laughs> yeah. caricature, uh, you know, Todd Akin uh, most yeah. memorably, um, it's still such a shortcut. It's a way to not engage with uh, Republican arguments against you, uh, and and it'll shrink that tribe. They'll they'll be more hardcore because they really do think that this predatory class is coming after them. But it's not a way to actually understand what your opponent is doing. But in this, in terms of rhetorical strategy, I mean, there are people uh, who. You know, cry when they say the Pledge of Allegiance and mm-hmm. cry at, well, at the State of the Union, maybe, maybe like four people. But there, there are people who do this and, and we would come along, many libertarians come along and be like, oh, well, you know, that's stupid and and be very cynical about it. In terms of rhetoric, should we – is that bad as a strategy? Well, and, other, I, and what other things are we doing rhetorically that are that work and don't work and, and what should I, we shut I, up about? Well, I, I don't know that it's a question about shutting up about anything, but I do think that there is uh, if libertarians and at reason, I mean, we're you know we're journalists, but we're also in the persuasion business. We think that a libertarian perspective offers a, a unique set of insights on the world and also policy prescriptions and ideas to go forward with. I do think that a lot of times libertarians uh, are trapped in a kind of Cold War mindset where there's a kind of big government on one side and then a kind of Milton Friedman rebel, you know, Mm. pure capitalist on the other side. I don't know that many people see the world in those terms anymore. And so if we're speaking in those terms, we're going to be missing a lot of conversations we should be involved in. I also think – you know the idea of saying the government can't do anything well or mm-hmm. it can't do anything right. Overselling. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually I don't think it's true. You can talk about the inefficiencies and you can always talk about how to make things better, but it you know to claim that the government can never do anything right, it flies in the face of most people. I think even most libertarians' basic you know concepts of everyday life or experience with everyday life. So we need to be mindful of that. And another thing that I'm starting to think about a lot more lately is is this concept of what happens for you know young not just younger people but people who don't orient immediately around politics like we take for granted libertarians and I think liberals uh, as well as conservatives politicize people okay you know the the really the big major story of the day is always big government versus you know the entrepreneur or something like that other people just don't they're not starting from that point of view and when you look at a lot of like younger entrepreneurs or hipsters or what not it's that's not what they're thinking about that's not the life that they were born into and if we want to reach them with the possibilities of – like libertarianism is not a set of dogmas that will be true forever and ever. It's a political philosophy and I think more properly understood as a temperament that's going to change over time. And the idea is how do you get to more freedom? How do you get to more individual liberty? And where you start with that is always going to change depending on where the conversation is. We and have, we have a hipster expert here because you live in Brooklyn. So yeah. <laughs> is, is he correct about that? Um, you know, I in the way that especially if you – Talk to people uh, and about people on the individual basis. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that you'll, you'll meet in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's an incredibly entrepreneurial place. You have all these hipsters you make, selling you uh, $13 pickles and this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and it's great. I mean, as a consumer, as a resident, I love it because the, the quality of the stuff is phenomenal and the, and the spirit of invention is terrific. And what happens to them inevitably is that they get smashed in the face by the same regulatory state that they helped elect and otherwise think. And so sort of talking about their experiences and, and stepping just one step back and saying – this is kind of what happens. You know, you living in, in – uh, we had a, a thing on the independence the other day about cat cafes. This apparently is a thing in the world, uh, uh, the, the horror, the horror. But like, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so what two cities are going to want to experiment with cat cafes? Portland and Brooklyn. Close. Okay. Uh, San what, what is a cat cafe? A, a cat, I, I, cafe I can't where... imagine two things. The first thing I can't imagine is any of my cats having had coffee, <laughs> and the second is giving my cats coffee. Yeah. It's going to I, I, I don't get a it. place where you can go in public and have your coffee or tea and bring your cat along. Oh, just bring the can, cat along, not, yeah. not actually feed the right. cat. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So okay. That's, cat uh, cafe. Catnip is for Boston. Like catnip is still illegal. So they like it catnip. almost yeah, uh, it's, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's Schedule One drug. Free the catnip. Yeah. Um, Boston and San Francisco are the yeah. two cities that uh, have been thinking about cat cafes. So, because the type of people who live there would be the type of people who'd be into that. 
But those regulation. are all, they're also the type of people who like regulate psychics mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So the, the regulations are stopping these cat cafes from happening. So uh, pointing out these kind of uh, uh, paradoxes is always a pretty useful step. Um, we are always at reason going to the individual case. I mean so many – there have been so many new libertarians minted by individual cases of police outrage over the last eight years. Mm-hmm. I mean Radley ba- – there is a, a category that I like to call Radley Balco libertarians. Yeah. They just basically mm-hmm. start – by seeing a video of some unbelievable no-knock raid or something like that and then they start proceeding from there. So when you talk about individual stories, that I think is much more uh, persuasive to people. It's a good starting point rather than always talking about this big, big generality, um, which as Nick said, you know, exists in the mind of people who are already politicized, but it doesn't necessarily and you, you, define them. You have to be careful of like soda ban, you know, uh, Buchenwald. Or, you know, like there's there's a lot of steps to fill in there, and it's not because you know. And one of the things is that I, I know a lot of liberals and conservatives in different ways who will say, "Well, you know, look, these are small things. You know, why are libertarians obsessed with you know zoning variances or so you know, and and, and, stands? Yeah, yeah oh and as God, as if this is like really because, the worst problem we have. Yeah, the national as if agenda. because it's not a matter of life and death, you know, then we shouldn't talk about it. And again, it is kind of constantly bringing up the idea that. Look, if you want – because I, mean, I, I suspect that all of us at this table are more or less consequentialists ultimately. You know that, But it's like if you want a world that is richer, is more interesting, is more innovative, is more varied, uh, has more possibilities for you and everyone around you, then you might be a libertarian and here's why. Yeah. And you bring it down to that level of like you want to open a cat cafe and then suddenly you're told now you got to get 20 licenses. But and that's one of Radley's sayings that I use a lot. Uh, you brought up Radley. The libertarianism happens to you. I mean, and, and the way he mm-hmm. writes about it, that's a very yeah. oppressive, obvious, right, you know, right. horrible yes. way it happens to yeah. people. But when you want to open a cat cafe, you might start looking at that stuff too. But by the same token, do libertarians and, uh, by sometimes the way, yes, scare was, people away? I mean I, Will I was, Wilkinson has this, uh, I was, this post well, I, he just recently made that uh, – said, look, if it were not for the libertarians who are weird and who have mm-hmm. their very radical ideologies and uh, if it weren't for them, perhaps mainstream liberals would actually be what they yeah. ought to be on the NSA. And 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 I, you know, I shot back at that and I was not completely you – know, I was actually quite unhappy with that in some ways. But in another sense, I mean he does have a point. Uh, I have seen people say, well, I don't want to make any kind of common cause with libertarians. Sure, I don't like the drug war. But you know what? You guys are crazy. And uh, and I and I want to say, well, you know, I, crazy is sort of in the eye of the beholder. And when we look at the system that we have right now, what what words come to mind for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, two responses you know. to that. One is that I think uh, Will's essay said much more about Will Wilkinson than it did about anything relevant to uh, today's politics. Mm-hmm. Um, is a pretty succinct way of putting it. Um, and another is that um, I mean the response to that tendency is that, OK, so that means you didn't want to go to any anti-war protest because international answer was there and you're totally fine with like the demonization of answer, which is a bunch of morons. But, uh, you know, and so therefore the anti-war movement was on the other side. Um, that that intellectual tendency is this tribalism and that shrinking and it's off-putting. It's the people who say, you know, we don't go to that rally against the NSA in Washington because there might be some creepy libertarians there. You're just exposed as an ignoramus mm. if you do well, that. Well, to Will's credit, he does say that this is completely illogical and it's not it's not you know good reasoning at all and he doesn't share it it's but just, he is saying well, this is reality this is what happens with people well, I, you know maybe um, you know. but uh, I'm, hey, there's I'm not- more it seems like there's more libertarians and libertarian fellow travelers than ever before I've been working at reason for 20 years I mean I've been a professional libertarian for 20 years I don't I've never been I've never seen as many libertarians and people saying like hey that sounds kind of interesting. Can, you know, can we talk about it than ever before? There's a sense of desperation happening right now. You see it a lot at Alternet and Salon.com and uh, and Huffington Post and, and uh, occasionally the MSNBC too. Of like, you know, don't those people don't buy like, into it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Sean Malentz had, a, had an atrocious piece. Really, really, just a bad, almost McCarthyite style. Although he didn't have power to uh, wield on other people, but type of thing, uh, trying to trash Glenn Greenwald, Edward Snowden. And Julian Assange, because you know Greenwald uh, spoke at Cato a couple of times, and and uh, and uh, uh, Snowden actually seems to be a fan of either Ron or Rand Paul or both, um, and that d- 
doesn't matter in the world. Every we're all like these hyphenated individuals for crying out loud, and and we go to single issue topics because that's how we operate. So I will make business and make break bread with people who are good on this one issue. You know, I'll, I will hang out with Bernie Sanders on this one mm-hmm. issue, and then we'll disagree about economics. That's a normal way of looking at it by sitting around and saying, "All right, are we first all ideologically pure?" Before we go against this topic, that is a losing and unattractive strategy, and I'm not too worried, frankly, about it. And this it came up in the in the Tea Party. There's a lot of Wilkinsonian uh, kind of uh, angst when the Tea Party arose, which was that these aren't libertarians; these are going to give libertarianism a bad name, and these kind of things. I don't care about any of that. I mean, I what I care about is is are these people um, going to be advancing? Uh, goals that are interesting to me. And mm. especially at the beginning, probably less now, um, the Tea Party was aimed at the size and scope of government, not at lowering taxes, not at like harshing on immigrants, not about harshing on welfare recipients. It was anti-Obamacare, anti-big government. And that was, you know, uh, that to me was a healthy uh, uh, tradition. And just because some people wore funny hats and didn't, you know, and were personally socially conservative, which I am not, um, is not, I don't think, an intellectually sound or interesting reason to throw your hands up at it and say, oh, you're discrediting, you know, libertarianism. And, Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's also worth talking. You know, I I mean, uh, to mangle a a paraphrase from Jack Kerouac, you know, on a certain level, I want to be out there with the mad ones, the dreamers, the nut jobs, (laughs) uh, because they're, you know, there's more interest, you know, they're more interesting. And, uh, you know, but by the same token, we also have to, and I think a lot of, you know, this is kind of the libertarian conceit of like, oh, liberals would really like us if they realized that we have exquisite taste and discerning uh, sensibilities about clothing and fashion and food and we're not, you know, knuckle dragging gold bugs or mm-hmm. something. Uh, you know, there are really dis- we can- libertarianism is not liberalism light or conservatism light. It is fundamentally different, I think, than either liberalism as we understand it, contemporary liberalism or conservatism. And it goes back to kind of what Hayek talked about in the uh, postscript to the Constitution of Liberty. You know, which is that libertarianism is not a prescription for the future. It's it's creating an operating system that allows people to flourish in wildly different ways. And that is going to annoy the hell out of a lot of contemporary liberals because in the end, and I'm not saying they're evil or rotten or they're you know, they're you know, they're pol pot except for the charisma, <laughs> but it's you know, they they don't like the idea of other people being able to live their life the way they want. You know, they would be upset if you open up a cat cafe and then you say, sorry, cats only, you know, no mm-hmm. dogs mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's like there's a lot of creepy stuff, you know, in the world out there and stuff like that. But libertarians have to, you know, you don't have to be a dick about it, but mm-hmm. you, you know, you do have to make it clear that like, no, it's not just like we're like liberals. We're just, you know, we also like guns. So maybe you guys have already kind of said this, but if, if I were to ask you, what kind of libertarian are you? And you know, some people would say, "Oh, consequentialist or objectivist," but I feel like you guys would say something different. Like, like if, I, if this like is, a, I would. If, I'm libertarian? more comfortable, maybe even than uh, Nick is, uh, since I'm reacting to a world that he helped create. But I'm a Reason Magazine libertarian. Mm-hmm. I used to describe mm-hmm. myself. In fact, when Nick first hired me, yeah. I think was a an economist style liberal, right. um, <laughs> whatever the hell that meant. Uh, no, or well, a, I mean, a Central yeah. European style liberal, yeah. which is to say that you know it, it, the. The post-communists and the anti-communists in, in Central Europe themselves were – considered themselves liberal. They wanted to be able to drink wine on the streets and smoke hash mm-hmm. and they thought the state had no business whatsoever in any kind of industry and in telling you what you could and couldn't do. Um, and that all resonated with me and it didn't have a voice here. But I, re- I eventually realized that the voice of that was reason. And um, and so there's an optimism with sort of reason-style libertarianism. It's not – it's more, I think, more consequential than bedrock philosophical, which a lot of people – um, uh, I think take issue with us for, but uh, uh, Reason has always been an outreach magazine. We're trying to talk to people where they're having conversations and say, "Hey, look, have you thought about this?" Um, you know, sometimes we're talking to them by trying to punch them in the, in the jaw when they're being particularly stupid, and if they have a lot of power, uh, and this is a rhetorical punch in the jaw, not a physical one, because of the <laughs> non-aggression Non-violence, principle. Yes. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, at the same time, we're in the persuasion business, not in the purity business, um, and so that all resonates with me. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I like to uh, think about using libertarian more as an adjective than as a noun. So maybe I'm like a libertarian human being or something. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, that sounds ridiculous. But I have pronounced libertarian tendencies. I mean, I definitely drink deep at the, you know, at the font of people like Milton Friedman and James Buchanan and uh, Mises and Hayek. Um, I didn't come to libertarianism through a kind of sociological upbringing. I mean, my parents weren't libertarian. I, I was introduced to Reason Magazine when I was in high school by my older brother. Uh, then I started working there. Uh, I've been influenced heavily by Matt since he's joined up. Um, but it's it's more, you know, I believe in free minds and free markets. I believe it makes a, a better, you know, richer, more interesting world that has more opportunities for everybody. Um, and that, and because of that, I am a libertarian. We're going to throw some real quick questions sure. at you. Uh, who's your all-time favorite politician? Go ahead, Nick. It's supposed to be a lightning round. You're supposed <laughs> no, to be quick. I, 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 uh, I don't. I don't have. I'd one. say. I'd say Václav Havel. Uh, he's, and I, I, he's not. Uh, yeah, I guess he's. A, he's not a politician. I, I like Roger Williams as my kind of uh, political hero. Least favorite. All of them. All of them. <laughs> Hitler. <laughs> Hitler. <laughs> Hitler. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer. Do you vote? Yes, enthusiastically. Yep. Why? Uh, it makes me feel good. That's good. It answer. makes me feel like I'm uh, participating in the process. Uh, even though there's uh, no statistical point to it necessarily. This one's, uh, yeah, oh, I, 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 no, I vote uh, pretty regularly. I especially vote on local tax issues and I also typically uh, – actually, I think always vote libertarian because I'm interested in ginning up uh, ballot access uh, numbers. And th- this, uh, this one is a little bit longer answer but what does rock and roll have to do with libertarianism? Oh, my god. Everything. I mean rock and roll was one of the first great – pop teen cultures. It's all about individual liberation. It, it sparked – Technical innova- – uh, technological innovation. Uh, you know, it, I mean it, as much as yeah, – I mean it's a perfect mix of social and you know, technical technologies changing the way people could express themselves and both through production. It was, I mean there weren't teenagers before rock and roll on some level and it, and it sort of described and gave people a, a, a tool around the world of saying, hey, but we're going to talk about our concerns and we're going to shake our pelvis this way. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly galvanizing libertarian force. And it, it is a uh, ground up, you know, a kind of grassroots way, a medium of expression. And it doesn't really mean anything or, mm-hmm. you know, rock and roll means something different in 1950s Cleveland than it did in Kansas or in New York or San Francisco. But as a kind of general catch-all for a medium of kind of popular music that expresses where people are, what their desires are, how they're interrogating their relationship to culture through the act of production and consumption, it's, you know, it's been a fantastic liberatory uh, vehicle. Mm-hmm. Rachel Maddow or Rush Limbaugh? Neither. Neither. Well, that's easy. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I prefer to uh, watch older Rachel Maddow than newer Rachel Maddow and both probably to uh, to Rush Limbaugh even though Rush Limbaugh occasionally says very nice things about uh, reason and all these kind of stuff. I, I just – the tribalism of both uh, is off-putting to me um, and it's hard to get over. I feel like I could cut and paste both of them and put together a really excellent libertarian. Uh, leaving a lot <laughs> of time to be sure, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I feel like I could, yeah. but yeah. it would it would take a lot of work, and mm-hmm. and you know, I can see see a little bit of a little bit of good in both of them. Yeah. Do you have a preference, Nick? Uh, you know, I, I, and I realize this is copping out, but I, let me throw a mix in uh, Glenn Beck, and the reason being that Glenn Beck, what I find most fascinating about him is his kind of public search or move journey away from a kind of cut a uh, cartoon version of Rush Limbaugh, a JV kind of conservative to something that in many ways approximates libertarianism where he's searching for that and he's reading and he's a, he an autodidact who is kind of – you know, it's, it's a ballsy move actually to educate yourself in public and you take a lot of heat. He obviously makes a lot of money. But what's most fascinating about him is the creation of an entirely new media platform and empire that is using current technology – to kind of do what he wants. And I think whether you like it, the message that he's sending or not, and sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, you know, he's creating a medium and he's, t- he's, th- he's the visionary, uh, the next step after, I mean, uh, you know, Matt is at uh, Fox Business. Roger Ailes is the guy who really created, like, you know, see, Ted Turner created cable news. Roger Ailes reinvented it as a tool mm-hmm. of kind of political discussion and everybody else is kind of sniffing his butt on that. Glenn Beck is actually creating the next step forward, which is something beyond politics using new new technology. And I think that's pretty interesting. Best argument against libertarianism? 
No. <laughs> the no, rate, the, yeah. there's so many, uh, uh, I think, uh, whether they're persuasive or not. Um, the ones that you find the, the, the most persuasive either to you on some side that this is something that actually is concerning and we should be concerned with. I mean uh, there's the, the argument against kind of the objectivist flavor of libertarianism that you just don't care about nobody. You're, mm-hmm. you're in it for yourself. You don't care about poor people. You think that altruism – in not the Randian sense but in the common understanding of the word altruism is bad. These types of things uh, is, can be an effective I mean, argument. I kind of believe that. I mean if that was what libertarianism is. But I just don't think that's what libertarian is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the ultra – the kind of categorical denial of government, uh, government capacity to do anything mm-hmm. uh, because as a matter of fact, I mean you know, we're going to have government-backed armies. We're you – know, I, I Police, suspect that yeah. most of us at this table probably, at, you know, at some level of education, went to a, a government-supported school, and um, you know they're not perfect. I'm not making a case for them, but they are not complete calamities or mm-hmm. incursions on, you know, on uh, they're not individual gulags, freedom. Yeah. yeah, to such a degree that we should be having an armed revolution, and that overstating the inefficiency and stupidity of government. Uh, is oftentimes it, it makes uh, you know it people can say look you can't be taken seriously and, and, and libertarianism oftentimes has inaquately uh, uh, interesting things to say about foreign policy yeah okay. and, and final question world. final question uh, best argument for libertarianism in in the most simple elevator pitch type of way uh, I would uh, I'd go with uh, Greenwich Village in New York, Venice Beach in L.A., and the Italian market in Philadelphia. These are places where uh, you know people the the relative ability of the government in their heydays to clamp down on what you know people wanted to do with some small or semi large measure of freedom and ability to create communities and and uh, subcultures. Uh, those were places where that couldn't happen and you end up with places that define cities and define the future and are just kind of cool and interesting and peaceful for the most part. It's the best structural path towards real tolerance of and innovation of different ways of living and being. Um, if you don't want your values offended, libertarianism is actually better than any other way. And oh, by the way, it also generates sort of more wealth and more interest and all kinds of other great benefits. I'd like to thank Nick and Matt for joining us and Jason for filling in. If you have any questions about this podcast, you can find me on Twitter at T.C. Burris. That's T-C-B-U-R-R-U-S. You can find me on Twitter at Jason Kuznicki. That's J-A-S-O-N-K-U-Z-N-I-C-K-I. This is Matt Welch. You can find me at M. Lee Welch, M-L-E-E-W-E-L-C-H. And I'm Nick Gillespie. I'm on Twitter at at Nick Gillespie. And thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Free Thoughts is a podcast project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute, and it is produced by Evan Banks. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.